Um, thank you very much, Jeremy. Um, I suppose, as they say, you know, one thing worse than being talked about is not being talked about, and I'm glad you made me out to be some kind of bodiceer against all the men, so that's great. Thank you very much. Um, you might think, you might think we're going to change gear now because I'm a scientist, but actually you'd be wrong because what we're going to do um, is pick up on the themes of the previous talks. And what I'd like to do is to show you that even we scientists can actually consider the kind of themes you've been hearing about already, which are really important, and uh, actually concern, on the one hand, the environment, and on the other, the self, the inner space, our needs and our desires. And what I'd like to do in this brief canter is not talk at my normal speed. I'll try and slow down, but nonetheless, um, just lay before you some of the ideas that, as a neuroscientist, um, we are starting to talk about and think about. Um, I love the picture on the right-hand side because it does remind me of when I first dissected a human brain, and I wondered if I got a bit under my fingernail. This wasn't the case, because I was wearing gloves, but I thought, if I did get a bit under my fingernail, would that be the bit that somebody loved with? Or would it be a memory or a hope? And, and how come this sludgy stuff that occupies the same universe as nasal hair or earwax or saliva or tooth enamel nonetheless does so much more, makes you the person that you are? So what does make you the person that you are? Um, let's say as opposed to a goldfish, and let's be brutal, goldfish don't have great personalities, do they? And if your kids had a goldfish um, and it died, you could sneak off to the pet shop, get another goldfish, kid would come home, and they wouldn't know any different. And you couldn't do that with uh, pet cats or dogs, and even if they might want you to, you certainly couldn't do it with their brothers or sisters. Because uh, as we evolve, so we start to do something uh, that is superlative for human species in the animal kingdom. We don't run particularly fast, we don't see particularly well, we're not particularly strong, but we do something amazing, uh, which makes us individuals, actually, and that is that we learn. So this is why we occupy more ecological niches than any other species on the planet, because you are unique, and your uniqueness, your individuality, is forged here. When you're born, you're born with pretty much all the brain cells you'll ever have, but it is the growth of the connections between the brain cells that accounts for growth after birth. Hence, even if you are an identical twin, you will have a unique pattern of brain cell connections. Why? Because these connections are going to be shaped and strengthened and constantly updated by your unique individual sequence of experiences. This is something in neuroscience called plasticity. Of course, it doesn't mean that the brain is made of plastic. It comes from the Greek plastikos, to be molded. And here's one wonderful example of neuronal plasticity in the human brain. Uh, this study involved three groups of adult human volunteers, none of whom could play the piano. And if you get the chance to volunteer for such an experiment, a word of advice, don't be in the control group. Because they stared at a piano for five days. <laughs> and what you're going to see next is what happened to the brain scans of their more fortunate counterparts who were taught five-finger piano exercises. However, there's a third group, and frankly, one could spend a whole morning discussing the results, especially with respect to this third group. So let's have a look. Um, we're going from left to right over the five days. You can see the scans of the control group show that the brain is literally unimpressed. <laughs> However, the guys that learned five-finger piano exercises, as you can see, are showing an astonishing change in brain territory, even over a five-day period. But the astonishing, exciting group, to my mind, are the third group, because these people were merely asked to imagine they were playing the piano. So what can we conclude from this? Well, first, that tired old dichotomy between mental and physical mind and brain clearly is not very helpful, and it's wrong. And secondly, as far as the brain is concerned, the contraction of the muscle is incidental to the thought that has preceded it. So the man who developed L-DOPA therapy for Parkinson's disease in the 1960s came up with a wonderful quote that I think this illustrates beautifully. He said, thinking is movement confined to the brain. And that's something I want to come back to. Thinking is movement confined to the brain, as you can see. So unless you've dozed off already, your brain is already changing. It's updating and rewiring every moment you're alive, every thought that you have. What's the basis of this? Well, in order to try and explore at the level of the mechanics, at the squalor, if you like, of the physical brain, which is what I do, um, what we can do in neuroscience is look at the impact of the environment on the brain, hence this wonderful segue from the previous talks, 
Um, but in our hands, in neuroscience hands, this is the kind of thing we get up to, which is to subject rats to a so-called enriched environment. Now, enrichment for a rat doesn't mean to say they come to the um, IQ squared conferences and hopefully have stimulating, exciting time. Enrichment for a rat, um, as you can see, involves ladders and wheels and um, little um, chances for exploring and social interaction. You just have to see how happy that rat looks. He look happy. He's having a lovely time. Um, and if you look um, at a single brain cell from the less fortunate group who are kept in isolated control conditions, uh, for the vast majority, who I suspect of you here are not familiar with looking at brain cells, this might look very straightforward. The blobby bit is the main part of the cell, but I'd like you to focus on the branches and now compare that with a brain cell from an animal who'd had this kind of interaction, and I hope you can see that the branches are more extensive. Why is this interesting or important? Well, even in a rat, when you are interacting, you are stimulating your brain, and the more you stimulate your brain cells, the harder they work, the more active they are, just like with muscle. And you know that when you stimulate muscle, it gets larger and stronger, so it is with brain cells. But the way the brain cell manifests its activity, its strength, its size, is actually to grow branches. And what's the point of that? Well, branches increase the surface area of the cell so that now, if you've had a stimulating interactive environment and you've grown more branches, you can make more connections. You can see one thing in terms of something else. Let's have a think about that. Here you see a cell injected with a beautiful fluorescent dye showing off the branches. But we can now think of it more schematically, if you like, as information points, and you can see even more abstract the way one can have idiosyncratic associations between um, erstwhile, previously independent terms or ideas, which have been founded by particularly your individual experiences, say. One example might be, think of a wedding ring. If you show a wedding ring to a small child, it will be golden, shiny, you can roll it, you can stick things through the middle. You then learn the generic quality of what rings are. You then learn why wedding rings are a special type of ring. You then learn about your own wedding ring, possibly, and your view of your own wedding ring might vary, of course, as you go from the honeymoon through to the divorce with the different associations. So clearly, you are updating and personalizing your mind by virtue of the endless increase in connections that you have. The more branches to brain cells, the more connections you can make, and I would suggest, therefore, the more personal significance of the world to you. I'd like to go further and suggest that if you are joining up the dots in this way, if you are making a connection of which you are aware, that is what understanding is. It's being aware of making a connection. One example of this, very briefly, uh, which puts me in a very poor light, but I think it's very illustrative, is when I was 16, I used to bully my three-year-old brother. The torture took many forms, from water pistols in the oven being melted in front of his eyes, <laughs> through, to, through to being forced to learn Shakespeare at the age of three. And one line was... Um, as you know, tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow creeps in this petty pace from day to day. To, and imagine, as someone said, that must have gone a storm in playgroup, having a three-year-old saying, out, out, brief candle, life is but a poor player. And I had just said to him, Graham, that being his name, uh, what does it mean? Do you understand out, out, brief candle? He would, of course, have said something like, oh, when I have a candle on my birthday cake, I blow it out. He couldn't have said or didn't say, oh, actually, it's a metaphor for death, because you're only three. And you'd need to have had the association of the extinction of candle with the extinction of life to truly understand that. So you're born, in the words of the great psychologist William James, into a booming, buzzing confusion. You evaluate the world in a sensory way. How sweet, how fast, how cold, how bright. But gradually, as the days turn into weeks, turn into months of your life, if you have a persistent, initially abstract visual pattern accompanied by colors and sounds that are meaningless, that you don't understand, slowly you will shift, nonetheless, to a meaning because this erstwhile abstract visual pattern, if it presents again and again and again, will finally be recognized as your mother's face. You'll go to a cognitive take on the world that will give a personalized meaning of the world to you. So here we have, you will see them as generic white middle-aged men in suits and ties. Some of you might think these are typical scientists, you'd be right. Um, but these are, these are my friends. These are David and Martin and Chris. And because I have associations of shared, failed experiments or um, successful, sometimes 
uh, episodes in the lab, we have a meaning and a significance to each other that you wouldn't understand. And similarly, you could show me your friends, family, and colleagues, and they would be generic to me, but deeply meaningful to you. So it's by virtue of the associations between the connections, I'd like to suggest that you make your own mind. The biological basis of the mind, I'd like to suggest, is the personalization of your brain through the unique dynamic configurations of your brain cell connections, driven in turn by your unique experiences. So here we are in downtown Oxford living our lives. Everyone has a past, a present, and hopefully a future. What is making your identity? What is making you unique? And you are unique for 100,000 years. We've stalked the planet. No one has a brain like yours. What is making it so special are your personalized connections. So you're starting off in this one-way street, how fast, how sweet, how cold, how bright. But then, as you form your neuronal connection, it gives you a basis to make the checks and balances, to evaluate what is coming in, to appreciate it in a wider context, so now you can make sense of the world around you, which is incidentally why as a species we're so successful. You can make sense of the world around you, you can understand what is happening, um, and you can have a unique and cognitive view of the world rather than a purely sensory one, and that's all embedded in your brain cells. Okay, so if that is the case, and I hope I've persuaded you that the, um, for the first part that the brain is very sensitive to the environment, now let's turn to notions of brands and self and needs and desires that were touched on earlier. Will this be changed by an unprecedented 21st century environment? Um, this is an example of the kind of change in the environment, certainly for young people, that appears to be going from three dimensions to two, from five senses to just mere hearing and vision. Here we are, 54% of kids aged between 13 and 17 are spending 30 plus hours in front of a screen. And what concerns me there is not the 30 but the plus. This means at least, at least four to five hours a day after school, not climbing a tree, not giving someone a hug, not walking along a beach, not feeling the sun on your face. Now, not that I'm casting value judgments here, but I think we should at least consider whether we want to go this route or not and what the difference might be. Let's think about social networking very briefly, and Jeremy's already taken my line about Twitter, so you're familiar with this now. Um, when you first talk to someone, words have 10% of impact. Eye contact and body language, as we know, take up a phenomenal amount of time. Um, voice, you don't have to speak a language to know if anyone's angry. Pheromones, there's sneaky chemicals that enable you to take prejudicial likes or dislikes to someone for no good reason. Um, and the power of a hug, as we all know, as long as you get it right, and you do have to get it right when you communicate with someone is very good. Um, now, eye contact, body language, voice, pheromones, and physical contact are not available on Facebook. So how are we going to learn these things? How are we going to rehearse them? If you have the evolutionary mandate as a human to adapt to the environment, if the environment doesn't stimulate or require or rehearse those things, may you not, therefore, not get to be very good at them. May you have reduced empathy. Um, an example of that, this is a study from the University of Michigan, indeed showing reduced empathy accelerated within the 30 years, particularly over the last 10. Um, now, someone could say, my multitude of detractors could say, well, of course, this isn't evidence, rather like people said that the correlation of smoking and cancer in the 50s wasn't evidence. Of course, it's not evidence in a causal sense, but it does at least require discussion and thought, and I would like to see now the next stage being some proper epidemiology, something to think about. Um, and the fact that people with autistic spectrum disorder are particularly comfortable in the cyber world. What does this say about identity? Well, if your identity is derived by your notoriety on Facebook, by the amount of um, comments you get, by your trolling or your happy slapping, if you define yourself, as I heard on a BBC film once, of girls saying, this is Facebook worthy, not I feel happy, or said, this is, what I'm doing is Facebook worthy. If you're incessantly and obsessionally connected, um, might we not, as someone called Sherry Turkle has pointed out in a book called Alone Together, actually feel more isolated? And could it be that people were twittering, here we are, 99, I have to tell someone this, something my cat did today, 2004, oh my God, cat pictures, moving cat pictures, and then that pinnacle of civilization, Twitter. Um, 1 p.m., cat sneeze, 102, cat sneeze again, 104. Has, are these people in existential crisis? <laughs> yeah. Reduced empathy, less robust identity. To show that I'm not a middle-aged, grumpy Luddite, this is a book that promotes the screen technologies, but what it says is that um, certain issues like visual motor coordination, great, that's definitely improved. IQ definitely improved. But have we seen a definite improvement along with IQ insight into, insight into the economic situation? We haven't, actually. 
And just because you can process information quickly and give appropriate responses, just like a computer, does not mean to say you understand. We confuse information and knowledge. If you Google on something like honor, an abstract concept requiring a lot of understanding, this being UK, this is what you get. Green. But if you showed that to a Martian, would they understand what honor was? Could you understand what honor was if you're a little kid just looking at that, looking at Google? And yet the Rose Report said that three-year-olds should be learning how to Google. And they Google honor, what are they gonna say? What are they gonna say to that? So, lack of metaphor or abstract concepts, a confusion with process and information processes versus understanding and knowledge. If you play a computer game to rescue the princess, for example, Yukihime, do you care about her? But you don't care about her. You don't care about her boyfriends or her future or what she's done. Whereas when you read Tolstoy, you care. Why is this? Because a book tells a story. You have a sequence. And remember I said thinking is movement confined to the brain. What is movement? Movement is a series of sequential steps, a delineated order, one to the next, to the next, to the next. When you read a novel, one chapter, next chapter, next chapter, a sentence, words, one after the other in fixed order. When you Google, when you use an app, when you use search engines, you are accessing random modules in different parallel order. Very different thought process. And I'd suggest that thinking requires movement in the brain. It requires a sequence showing that I'm not alone. Chairman of Google, I worry the level of interrupt, the sort of overwhelming rapidity of knowledge, of information, sorry, is in fact affecting cognition, it's affecting deeper thinking. I still believe that sitting down and reading a book is the best way to really learn something. Another, another trend that should be explored, increasing methylphenidate, better known as Ritalin. Why is this? Is it medicalizing the condition more? Are doctors being more liberal in their prescriptions? Or could it just be? Could it just be that little kid who's um, interacting in a very stimulating, fast, exciting way with the screen um, is therefore, as is their evolutionary prerogative, adapting to that environment so that then they go to school, they're required to sit still for 15 minutes and they fidget a bit, then they're um, prescribed an amphetamine-based drug to cure them. Just something we need to look into. Fragmented attention, shorter attention span, risk-taking. Um, if you damage this part of the brain, the prefrontal cortex, uh, then uh, the syndrome, the sickle frontal syndrome, is taking more risks. This also happens in fat people. They take more risks. And we know this is an increasing problem. And if you are overweight, that is if you have a high body mass index, then guess what? You have a lower activity also in the prefrontal cortex, which is also low in schizophrenics, which in turn is comparable to children who also have an underdeveloped prefrontal cortex. It only comes on stream in late teenage years. Easy, distracted, shorter attention span, can't interpret poems like out, out, brief candle or metaphor, underfunctioning prefrontal cortex. What do they have in common? Well, anyone who eats knows the consequence of eating. Anyone who gambles knows the consequence of eating. But the thrill, the thrill of those things trumps the consequences. Schizophrenic painting going from left to down, bottom right. Um, in psychiatric terms, the person was deteriorating. Artistic terms, you might think not. But what's happened is you've gone from cognitive to sensory. So could this be that the press of the senses in these cases, associated with an underfunctioning prefrontal cortex, means that you're living literally for the moment. As with the screen, you're excited, addicted, and rewarded, and that all comes about through a chemical called dopamine. And dopamine is a fountain in the brain that inhibits the prefrontal cortex. So this is how neuroscience is starting to understand these notions, this, if you like, living for the moment, where you have this fast, intense screens, you have lots of dopamine released, this simulates reward-seeking addictive behavior. More dopamine release inhibits prefrontal cortex, bringing about the same kind of mindsets as childhood, schizophrenia, obesity, the yuck and wow world of the moment where sensation trumps cognition and hence the screen with its premium on strong sensation will trump cognition. To show that I'm not completely making this up, this is a recent paper showing indeed changes in the brain. And this is a shameless plug for the book that says it in less than 15 minutes, sorry, more than 15 minutes, um, in less garbled, but it should now be superseded by the book that's on sale outside called You and Me, which has just come out. Um, I'd just like to leave you with the thought that we are facing a scenario here comparable to climate change. There's a load of separate issues. It's not one problem. It is unprecedented in terms of the 21st century. And above all, it's in our hands to do something. The difference is that climate change is all about damage limitation, whereas mind change could all about, for the first time, being exploiting en masse our potential to the full. Few, sorry to rush, thank you. Thank you. 
For more big thinking about the future, go to iq2if.com.